Welcome to the Manwa world. King Bainas Roche stands with an air of authority. His voice echoes through the grand halls of the palace as he says, I, King Bainas Roche of the Durand Kingdom, solemnly decree the dissolution of our marriage. Our Noah Saliard Cajun. You are hereby stripped of your title as Queen of Duran. As your presence is no longer welcome in this kingdom, you must now return to your home, in the capital of the empire. As a last act of kindness, I intend to provide you with an old carriage for the journey. If you beg him in earnest, perhaps his imperial majesty will allow you to remain within his palace. Blood is thicker than water, after all. He may be willing to put past differences aside and take you back in. His decision to dissolve the marriage is fueled by a mix of frustration and newfound liberation. Arnoa Saliard Cajun, the once queen, receives the news with a mix of shock and defiance. Her noble lineage and pride is wounded. Larissa Estiae, a lady-in-waiting with a hidden agenda, revels in the unfolding drama, her loyalty shifting towards the ambitious pursuit of becoming the new queen. Larissa Estia is asking the king, Oh my. Does she really intend to travel all the way to the capital in a tiny little carriage? I'm nauseated just thinking about it. Larissa is the daughter of a wealthy Duranian noble. And Queen Arnoa's lady-in-waiting. She is allowed the luxury of living in the royal palace as a lady-in-waiting. And is widely known as King Binus's other woman. The king looks at Larissa with affection and calls his name, Larissa. Larissa replied, I understand this is an light-hearted occasion, but I wanted to offer you my support, nevertheless. As a sign of his everlasting affection, King Binas presented Lady Larissa with a special gift. A finely wrought silver tiara. Its centerpiece a black diamond more brilliant than starlight and of a hue deeper than the mysterious depths of the sea. This gem was part of a pair, and the other diamond was embedded into King Binaz's crown. Both diamonds had come into King Binaz's possession as part of Arnoa's dowry. Not a soul in the empire could have foreseen this divorce. It seemed unfathomable that Arnoa Saliard Cajun, sole imperial princess and bearer of the empire's most illustrious lineage would be subjected to such a humiliating divorce. Such a pity to think they'd end up divorced. Larissa, does she not hail from far nobler ancestry compared to the king? King says in a grease of what that, s it she wasn't even worth my time. I should have divorced her sooner. She may have been the imperial princess. There were different voices chattering in the palace as people were whispering in each other's ear, but with her head hanging in shame before his majesty. She appears the same as any other divorcee. This divorce is an embarrassment to the imperial family. Even if she is allowed to return, I'm sure she'll spend the rest of her days locked away in a tower. It would be more fitting to call Lady Larissa our queen. Upon hearing these voices the princesses look sad whereas on the other hand Larissa is looking happy. It was no secret that King Binas did not love his queen but the prevailing expectation was that divorce would be avoided for the benefit of his kingdom. This was a reasonable conclusion. Given that Queen Arnoa was Emperor Luciano's half-sister, and niece of Duke Rickel, who had made a name for himself as a tyrant in the southern regions of the empire, claiming a woman of such noble pedigree as his queen, gave King Binas a sense of superiority he had not been privileged to feel before as a ruler of a tiny sovereign state. That gave him reason to maintain this loveless marriage for two years. But eventually his heart turned entirely in favor of his mistress, Larissa. As Larissa was no longer satisfied playing the role of his mistress, King Binas decided to crown her as his new queen. Of course, it was not an easy decision. Several factors contributed to why their marriage of two years ended in divorce. The first was that he had reason to believe Larissa was pregnant. The second was the queen's sudden change in conduct, which proved to be quite wicked indeed. And the third and final reason, which led King Binas to move forward with proceedings for the divorce, 
was his certainty that the dissolution of their marriage would still leave him in good standing with the emperor. He was assured of this by the emperor's messenger who came to him in the middle of the night, a sorcerer who possessed the cold beauty of a statue. The emperor's messenger came to meet the king and gave him the message of emperor. The emperor will not oppose the divorce between the king and queen of Duran. The esteem in which this kingdom holds the empire has already been demonstrated by your behavior in the past. King thoughts that he's here to discuss the terms of the divorce. Emperor's messenger reveals more information as, the dowry offered by the imperial princess is but a trifle. Compared to the riches stored in the imperial treasury, it would be unwise to ruin diplomatic relations between our two kingdoms over such a trivial matter. The king is shocked and he in a state of happiness. Does the messenger mean Tio say? I can end it. The emperor will not demand back Arnoa's dowry even after the divorce? I can part ways with that woman without suffering any consequences at all. King Binas, cold and resolute, dismisses the value of his former queen with a mix of disdain and arrogance. His decision to divorce is not only a personal matter but a strategic move to secure favor with the powerful Emperor Luciano. King to princess standing in the palace, it's time to say farewell. I didn't intend for us to end this way from the start. Perhaps this could have been avoided if you had behaved with a little more resp. If Arnoa had been able to subdue that damned pride of hers just. And if she had clung to him, begging for his love. The night of the wedding. Desiring to snub the haughty princess, Binus sought Larissa's chambers. But if Arnoa had humbled herself. And waited for him, playing the coquette like Larissa always did. The king continued his dialogue then. Perhaps I might have given this marriage a chance. Night after night, Binas abandoned his lawful wife for the embrace of his mistress. But Arnoa made no attempt to stop him, not even once. King whispered in the ear of Larissa who is standing beside him about the princess that, I'm certain she thought I was beneath her. Being a ruler of such a small and powerless kingdom, I see you remain insolent to the very end. I wish never to lay eyes on you again. Go back to where you belong, and leave us in peace. Saying this he throws divorce on princess. The emotions intensify as the divorce document is thrown onto the princess. Arnoa, once proud and regal, now stands broken and betrayed. King Binas, however, remains stoic, convinced of the righteousness of his actions. The twist in the tale comes as Princess Arnoa, instead of crumbling in despair, surprises everyone with a composed reaction. Her apparent joy and gratitude for the dissolution of the marriage leave the court in shock, questioning her sanity. Princess addresses the king, so the deed is done. We are divorced. I suppose there is no need to keep up false pretenses any longer. King Shocking said H.A. what? Princess lifts her head and said since you are not my husband anymore. King furiously said, What is the meaning of this? Princess calmly replied to King, We are officially divorced, are we not? King, I see the news must have been quite a shock, for it seems you have lost both your mind and manners. Princess Arnoa surprises the court with her composure and gratitude, leaving the onlookers bewildered. I know not what you mean. I've suffered enough for the past two years, and I couldn't be more grateful to you for ending our marriage. People in the palace whispering, Does she fail to grasp what's happened to her? Princess, I've endured you and your court for as long as I could. And you've given me precisely what wanted. Allow me to thank you for saving me the... King, how dare you speak to me in that manner? Princess, unfortunately, it appears you are the one. Who fails to grasp what is happening, Binus. King looks very angry as he says... I've never seen her smile like that during our entire marriage. It seems the shock of the divorce has gotten to your head, but may I remind you. Princess made an announcement which left everyone in shock. Bell come out and deliver the emperor's message to the king of Duran. The palace whispers in confusion as Arnoa's true intentions come to light. I ask she insane? 
There is just no other excuse for her behavior. What in the world is she talking about? The introduction of Bell, the enigmatic sorcerer, adds an extra layer of mystery to the unfolding drama. With skin as white as snow and hair. As dark as night. With silver-gray eyes that seem to penetrate the gaze of any onlooker. And a face so beautiful, IT appeared to be chiseled by the gods. It was the very same sorcerer who Binus spoke to the previous night. King Binus was taken aback at the sight of the boy. Upon seeing him, he exclaimed, What is the emperor's messenger doing here? The young messenger, clad in white and black shoes, calmly responded, I came because I was called. Swirling in his light brown royal dress, he continued, Although I feel more like an errand boy than a messenger, did you not hear the new empress call for me? Larissa, visibly stunned, questioned. The new empress? Binas, growing irritated, added, I don't know what you mean. Meanwhile, Arnoa, holding a divorce letter, grinned continuously. Standing beside him, he revealed, Luciano Cajun is dead, the imperial messenger. I am here to announce his passing. Binas, in utter shock, exclaimed, The emperor. Fifteen dead? In anger, he shouted, Nonsense! His imperial majesty is in fine health. The undisputed tyrant and ruler of the empire, the young emperor Luciano Cajun, had no heirs. Binas inquired, If what you say is indeed true, then Prince Arian must now be seated on the imperial throne. The messenger replied, No, Prince Arian is also dead. Adding, They were both assassinated. Servants were shocked, and whispers filled the air. Binas loudly exclaimed, What foolishness is this? How dare you spout such lies about his imperial majesty? Arnoa insisted. The news of his passing is no lie. The message comes from the imperial messenger himself, so it cannot be a falsehood. Binas, deep in thought, pondered, That's impossible, but what will happen if this news is really true? He added, no one could have foreseen such a sudden turn of events. Emperor Luciano was not involved in any known disputes, and he was in excellent health. Furthermore, only a few years had passed since his coronation. He recalled the moment when he, wearing his coat, addressed a servant, saying, I find there is an excessive amount of appointments as of late. The servant bowed and replied, I shall see if any items can be rearranged on the itinerary, your majesty he ordered. We'll discuss this further upon my return. The servant replied, Yes, your majesty. I shall be waiting patiently. In his thoughts, he pondered, making the news of his assassination all the more unexpected. He inquired, Then who will inherit? The boy replied, As the emperor had no heirs, the crown will be passed down to whoever is next in line. He explained, According to your nuptial agreement, the husband would have been designated as the successor of any inheritance that was passed down to his wife. Not just wealth. Meanwhile, Arona stood, twisting her arms and smiling. He added, But any title as well. In other words, you would have been the successor of the imperial throne. Binas and Larissa were in extreme shock. He asked, But that's... And staggered, falling to the ground. Larissa came to hold him, saying, your majesty, the boy continued, if you had just waited one more day, the entire empire would have been yours to claim. However, since you have already acquired a divorce, the imperial throne now belongs to someone else. Binas kept his hand on his mouth and uttered, no. While raising his hand, the boy said, yes, it belongs to none other than her imperial majesty, Arnoa Saliard Cajun. He turned towards Binas and asked, do you refuse to bow down to your new empress? Binas was in utter shock, unable to figure out what was happening. He exclaimed, This can't be. Arnoa started laughing and said, Ha! You heard him, Binas. She added, As your new empress, I demand you show me the appropriate courtesy. Binas got up and said, I refuse to do so. He clenched his teeth and leaned towards Arnoa, screaming, You the empress? That is absurd. Until a moment ago, you were the queen of Duran. 
smiling, Anoa replied. And according to the imperial messenger, I am now the ruler of this empire. Why do you pretend to be ignorant of it? Bainas, irritated and furious, seeing her smiling, said, This is preposterous. Larissa held him, saying, Your Majesty. Arnoa fluttered her hair and said, Hugh, it matters not whether you bow down to me or not. She added, I expected as much from you. Ha, I'm sure you recall that when I married you, I brought with me a carriage full of gold as my dowry. Have it prepared at once. Bainas asked her, What? She added, For I plan to start off on my journey before the day is done, just as you wanted. Seeing her so boldly, Bainas started thinking, Have I ever seen such a cold expression on Arnoa's face before? Arnoa turned towards him and screamed out, Bainas, are you deaf? Don't tell me you meant to divorce me and keep my dowry, too. Bainas started trembling, clenched his wrist, and said, No, I know what I heard. He shouted, The messenger told me the dowry was a trivial matter to the imperial family, and they had no intention of getting involved in such trifles. As he rushed towards Arnoa, the emperor's messenger came in front of him and stopped him, saying, Stay back, he asked Bainas. It would be unwise to ruin diplomatic relations over such a trivial matter. Was what I told you. He protected Arnoa and added, Judging by his behavior, I can imagine what your life must have been like as his queen. He twisted his arms and said, Are you still unable to comprehend my message? Any half it would have realized the dowry must be paid back in full in case of a divorce. He asked, Is it not obvious? Binus trembled and denied him saying, Th, that can't be true. He staggered and fell down. Larissa held him, calling, Your Majesty. Arnoa ordered him, saying, King Binus, I shall give you one hour. Prepare a carriage filled with gold. She added, If there is not enough gold in the treasury, scrape off the gilding on the soft walls and spires of the palace, and pick off the jewels on the scabbards of the royal guards. Wait, if after confiscating the royal throne and crown, there is still room left in the carriage, I shall fill that space by cutting off the hair on your very heads. She leaned towards him and said, And of course, the pair of my mother's black diamonds on your heads. I must not forget about those. After saying this, he called the emperor's messenger, saying, Bell! He replied, Yes, your imperial majesty. Your wish is my command. The royal servants started whispering. What's happening there? What will happen now? What on earth is happening here? Larissa hugged him and said, Your Majesty. Binas, what do we do now? He didn't reply. She again asked, Your Majesty? Meanwhile, Belle snatched her crown from her head. Binas screamed, Larissa! She's holding her head, screaming. Act. Binas asked her, are you hurt? Binus screamed out loudly. What is the meaning of this? I've had enough of this insolence. How dare you? Bell held Binus's collar and snatched his crown from his head. Larissa asked him, Your Majesty, are you all right? He said, You may be a sorcerer, but you are nothing more than a lowly messenger. Binus sat down, clenched his hand, and said, King Binus, you have gone too far. He screamed out, This is an insult to the kingdom of Duran. The messenger exclaimed as he snatched the crown from Larissa's head. With a disdainful huff, he added, You remain petty to the very last. Examining both crowns adorned with sparkling diamonds, he continued, You are nothing but a cad who had nothing to give your mistress except for the jewels from your wife's dowry. Gazing at Binas, he questioned, And you have the audacity to talk of insults? In a fit of anger, he flipped off the crowns, causing them to break and scatter crystals and diamonds. Larissa, witnessing the destruction, gasped. My tiara! Black diamonds from the crown fell to the ground. Swiftly, the messenger gathered the black diamonds in his hands and addressed Larissa. Your Imperial Majesty! He smirked while swirling the diamonds in his hands. Arnoa, observing the scene, was astonished. The messenger approached Arnoa, took her hands, and politely stated, I've retrieved them, just as you desired. 
Smiling, he handed her the black diamonds and asked, Does that please you? Arnoa, filled with gratitude, responded, Yes, well done. She touched his face affectionately and declared, Let us leave this place. I've had enough of their foolishness. Meanwhile, Binas fell to his knees unconsciously. Larissa tried to support him, pleading, Come to your senses, your majesty. A concerned servant rushed to Binas and exclaimed, Your majesty, are you all right? Binas, bewildered, uttered, I don't understand. What on earth is happening? Arnoa, smiling, announced, Today has quite possibly been the most wonderful day I have ever experienced. I'd like to see exactly what I've inherited. Arnoa was reminiscing about her past when her brother entrapped her in the tower. In the midnight, the castle was illuminating with lights. Her brother grabbed her hand and said while showing her the castle, Look before you, Arnoa. Arnoa was in grief. He added, Everything you see, this place, the empire, belongs to me. And as your ruler, I hold your very life in my hands. Never forget this fear. You'd be wise to suppress any spark of rebellion or ambition within you. He added, Always remember that your worthless life will be wiped out from existence the minute I let go of your arm. He was her brother, Luciano, her half-brother, who locked her away in a tower as soon as the preceding emperor passed away. Then, as soon as she turned eighteen years old, she was married off to the king of Duran. She added, Looking back, there was not even a valid reason for the marriage. Binas, the king of Duran, was more interested in my dowry than in me. After marrying him, she started thinking, but I found comfort in the fact that marrying him at least allowed me to be freed from that tower. I convinced myself that a little infidelity would not shake me. I only had to suffer through his efforts to shame me a few times a week, which I found tolerable. Then, Larissa came into her life. However, we were fated to be together. I've never loved another woman in my life. Binas was holding Larissa's hand and saying to her, Promise me you'll always stay by my side. Larissa. She replied, Your Majesty. I'm speechless with happiness. It was their wedding day. Larissa was dressed up in a pink royal dress. All the guests praised them. They make such a handsome couple that I feel a bit envious. They truly are a winning pair. Meanwhile, Arnoa stepped in holding two glasses of wine. Everyone got shocked to see her. She said, Your Majesty, may I take my leave now? Binas turned towards her and asked, What are you still doing here? Larissa reminded him, Do you not recall your majesty? You asked her majesty the queen to wait with our wine glasses. She hugged him and said, So that you could have the first dance with me. Binas snuggled her and replied, Oh, yes. I see my queen has faithfully carried out my request. He scoffed at her and added, I didn't realize you were so obedient. It's not as if you're some servant. I thought you'd have more dignity than that. Larissa asked Binas. Whatever shall we do, Binas? I'm afraid Her Majesty had no idea. She added, That you wouldn't drink that wine anyway since it's been sitting out for too long. You've always preferred your wine chilled. Larissa, the daughter of Count Estiae of Duran, the Queen's chief lady-in-waiting, the King's first love and current mistress. On seeing them together, Arnoa started thinking. I thought it was strange that I was given a lady-in-waiting so soon after my marriage. He just needed an excuse to keep Larissa close by. Arnoa placed wine glasses back at the dish and said, Then I shall return to my chambers as I am not feeling well. Meanwhile, Binas interrupted her by saying, What a shame. Larissa wanted you to enjoy the festivities with us. Larissa screamed out with excitement. Yes, we don't mind your presence here at all. She started rushing towards the stage and added, Please, you'll stay a bit longer. She sat on a chair and asked, Won't you? Binas was standing beside her chair. She taunted Arnoa by saying, Although, you'll have to stay on your feet as there is no seat for you here. Arnoa left from the wedding running towards her room. She thought, Are all marriages this horrible? Where did we go wrong? She reminded, Was it on our wedding night when Binas left for Larissa's chambers as soon as the ladies-in-waiting were dismissed? 
At that time, when Binas said to her, Or was it when I overheard his lies about the night we didn't even spend together? The imperial princess was not so high and mighty standing naked before me. If I had to evaluate her, she'd receive the lowest marks. She got trembled at that moment. She thought, or perhaps when Binus said, Larissa will remain in charge of household matters. If there is anything you need, be sure to get her approval first. She thought that. And there was also when she stepped on her dress and fell down. Binus scolded her by saying, Are you blind? Larissa lost her balance because you stepped on her skirt. Thank heaven she did not fall. Arnoa squeezed her dress and thought. Binus has always been an imbecile. Despite the challenges, I could bear it all, as long as it meant I could escape that tower. She reminisced about her past when her brother entrapped her in the tower. My half-brother Luciano despised me since the day I was born. Perhaps that was because he was envious of my mother's noble lineage, which was more powerful than his own. This was understandable, as my mother, Anastia, was the matriarch of the Rickle family before her marriage to the emperor. She added, Father had always been of delicate health. After his death, I must have become a thorn in Luciano's side. Knowing this, I tried to keep out of his sight, staying with my mother's side of the family. But he dragged me to the palace as soon as he ascended the throne and locked me away in that tower. Yes, I'd rather be there than remain confined in that place. I would have willingly forgiven Binas for his senseless behavior. She twisted her arms and thought, except when he gave away that tiara and the jewel that adorned it. Those diamonds were a keepsake from my mother. She also received them as a gift from father when they were young. She added, So the value of those precious diamonds was already well known in high society. And of course, they were a part of my dowry. When I first saw Larissa wearing that tiara, I was furious. But after fury came fear. She disclosed her father's intentions, saying, when Count Estia saw his daughter at the king's side, wearing the tiara embedded with that famous jewel, he aspired for his daughter to become queen. Since that day, I have been a target of ongoing assassination attempts. She added, Aside from being fed poisoned food, I lived under constant threat of attack. I could hardly sleep at night for fear that assassins would break into my chambers through the windows. I could die at any moment, so I lived in terror. Realizing Duran was no better than the tower, everything felt futile. Arnoa put her hand on her head, took a sigh, and said, How much more can I take? I'm at my wit's end just surviving day to day. While opening the door, she started thinking, What can I possibly do to change any of this? I'll just toss more firewood in the fireplace for now and get a good night's. She saw a white beast in front of her and got astonished. Huh! What's this? She thought. Why is there a beast fast asleep in my chambers? Is this the Count's new plan to kill me? She stepped forward, thinking. Since the assassin he sent last time got caught, perhaps his new plan is to set a wild beast on me. Still. The beast was sleeping, and suddenly he flicked his eyes. My goodness. I've never seen such an enormous animal. Arnoa was thinking. It's rather beautiful. The beast growled, and she got scared. Meanwhile, she slapped her head and realized. What was I thinking? Did the fatigue go to my head? She panicked and started rushing towards the door to escape. This is not the time to gawk. I should go out to the corridor and ask for help. She hurried towards the door in an attempt to escape. As she rushed, panic set in. Meanwhile, the beast awoke and lunged at her. Upon hearing its footsteps, she turned around, visibly terrified. In a matter of seconds, the beast charged at her, causing her to fall, with the creature standing over her. In the grip of fear, Princess Arnoa questioned her fate as the leopard held her. How can this be? Am I to die like this? Suddenly, the leopard underwent a mystical transformation, morphing into a human figure. The sorcerer, revealed to be Belle, stood before her and asked her, Is it you? he questioned. Princess, bewildered and frightened, could only manage to ask, What on earth is happening? He's a sorcerer. And seeing as he is able to polymorph, 
He must be a very powerful one at that. What could he possibly be doing here? Sorcerers are known to keep to their own kind in the territory of Prehen. Answer me. Are you Arnoa Saliard Cajun? Sorcerer demanded. The princess, nodding her head in acknowledgement, awaited an explanation. All right, then on to business. Here, this letter is for you, he said, handing her a letter. Princess, still bewildered, questioned. A letter? Who would dash? As she took the letter from the sorcerer. Sorcerer, I was told he was a friend of yours. Could it be? Princess, reading the letter which says, Tell me whenever you wish to leave Duran. I'll find someone from the academy to put a curse on King Binas. She muttered, Anakin? Did Anakin send you here? Sorcerer, indeed he did. He was always an arrogant pest, even when we were students at the academy. Keep reading. The princess continued to read Anakin's letter with shock. My dearest friend Enoe, the emperor and his successor have been assassinated. I've sent you a gift. Knowing you, I'm sure you'll be able to use it wisely. I sincerely wish you the best of luck. Your loyal friend, Anakin. A assassinated? Drat! Princess Arnoa exclaimed, shocked at the news. Both of them, at the same time? But that's impossible. The sorcerer interrupted, stating, That isn't even the real concern. Princess, now contemplating her situation, murmured, If the emperor and his next in line are both dead, that means I'm the only heir left. However, her thoughts drifted to her marriage vows I. Arnoa Saliard Cajun, do hereby solemnly vow to become the Queen of Duran, pledging faithful obedience to my husband, agreeing to transfer all worldly wealth and titles under his name. Realizing the complications she thought that, I am bound by my marriage vows. The emperor already had a successor, and I did not expect any title to be bestowed upon me. Regardless, the emperor and his successor are both dead, which means that imbecile will become the emperor. Were you and your brother on close terms? Although, you do look more angry than sad for that to be true. The sorcerer inquired, curious about the princess. My mind is preoccupied with various matters, that is all, he said, sensing the emotions of princess. As the princess continued to read the letter, she found a line that caught her attention. I've sent you a gift. Is that the only explanation you're giving me, Anakin? So where is it? She questioned. Where is what? The sorcerer responded innocently. My gift, she pressed further. Are you disappointed that I came empty-handed? Perhaps I should have prepared a gift as an offer of my condolences, he teased. And oh, that is not what I mean. Do you truly have nothing else to give me? She clarified. And oh, I do not, the sorcerer affirmed. The princess, skeptical of the sorcerer's response, thought, he appears much too composed to have taken the gift for himself. Anakin must have had a reason for sending this letter. A letter and a sorcerer, at any rate. And asked the sorcerer about the circumstances that led him there. I was simply trying to be a good friend. The sorcerer explained. A good friend? According to Anakin, there existed no such thing as a good sorcerer, at least not within the halls of the Academy of Magic. If a non-sorcerer desires something from a sorcerer, he must always pay a price. He replied, I'd rather not delve into specifics. She interrupted, Or perhaps you were challenged to a wager. He turned, looking at her with anger. She smiled and said while holding the letter, It appears I am correct. A sorcerer's wager mandates acceptance if challenged by citing their full name, as ordained by the sorcerer's code. Arnoa emphasized, Winning the wager is no easy task. Sorcerers have lengthy, difficult names, and even if one were able to overcome that obstacle, most people end up losing the wager, paying the price with their life or losing something precious to them. However, Anakin was unlike most people. Expressing irritation, she stated, No surprises there. Then looked at the letter, pondering, But why? Why would Anakin challenge you to a wager? The boy smirked and replied, I can't say for certain myself. 
Arnoa contemplated. Anakin's letter said the Emperor was dead, and the role of announcing his passing has always been reserved for the master of the Enchanted Tower. As the boy smiled at the situation, Arnoa realized and exclaimed, You are the master of the Enchanted Tower! He confirmed. It appears you truly are as clever as they say. Adding, That is correct. I am here to fulfill my duty as the Imperial Messenger. Now where may I find a fellow named Binas? I must make myself useful to the Empire by delivering the news to him. Arnoa, serious, questioned. Did Anakin tell you to come to me before you met Binas? He affirmed. Yes. Placing the letter on the table, she presumed. I presume you'd decline if I were to seek a favor from you. He responded. Well, of course I would. It is no simple task to persuade a sorcerer to do your bidding. Concerned, she declared. Then I'm afraid I must challenge you to a wager. On hearing this, he sighed. A wager? How will you go about doing that when you don't even know my... He flinched when Arnoa added. Belcherius Dion Askel Rupilation Perhen Nerudi. Astonished, he questioned. What? She clarified. That is your name, isn't it? Belcherius Dion Askel Rupilation Perhen Nerudi, called Bel for short. Irritated, he turned, saying, Ugh, Anakin, that sly bastard. She insisted. Now you must join me in my wager. Arnoa continued. The last thing I want is for Binas to sit on the imperial throne. If I win. Bell stood up from his chair, and she slipped the letter out of her hands, declaring, I shall acquire a divorce and become the empress myself. The letter dropped on the ground. Princess Arnoa, with a fire in her eyes, expressed her grievances. What was my recompense for allowing Luciano to lock me away in that tower, and then consign me to a marriage that was no better than exile? The servants under my command disappeared one by one, having been falsely accused of treason. I was the scapegoat of Luciano's rage and violent temper. Then I was subjected to Binas's mockery, and now my very life is in jeopardy as Count Estia aims to have me assassinated. Luciano was the cause for all my suffering, and yet the fool died without even a successor. At this rate, Binas will ascend the imperial throne, and I shall become a nameless queen destined for even more humiliation. I must attain the sovereignty for myself. Turning toward Bell, the imperial messenger, she declared with authority, And you, the imperial messenger, shall acknowledge me as the new empress, the twenty-eighth master of the enchanted tower and ruler of the territory of Perhen. In the halls of the palace, Princess Arnoa contemplated the mysterious figure before her, Bell, the master of the enchanted tower. She recalled the whispers and tales surrounding him. Bell, the master of the Enchanted Tower, she mused. I have heard some unverified rumors regarding him before. As the imperial messenger, Bell stood with an air of enigma. His unparalleled magical prowess was inherited from birth as the son of the esteemed sorceress Amaryllis, the twenty-sixth master of the Enchanted Tower. Despite his position as an imperial vassal, he remained elusive, much like many sorcerers who tended to live in seclusion, isolating themselves in a territory even the emperor dared not govern. They only emerged from their isolation to fulfill their duty as imperial messengers, honoring a covenant established in ancient times. Princess's mind wandered to the past, remembering a conversation with Anakin. Anakin had shared insights about Bell. One of my schoolmates is exceptionally talented. Intrigued, Princess inquired. Oh, do go on. He's a genius, yet he has no friends due to his horrible temper. He makes wagers with other students, depriving them of their wealth and magical powers, thereby rendering them unable to live as sorcerers any longer. Anakin explained, admiring the bravery of Bell. Shocked, Princess questioned. What? How can he be allowed to attend the academy after committing such misdeeds? Anakin continued. He was expelled, although it's uncertain whether it was due to his notorious behavior. He is said to have returned to Perhen after that, inciting the previous master of the Enchanted Tower into a duel, emerging victorious, and claiming the tower for himself. 
As the pieces of the puzzle came together in Princess Arnoa's mind, she couldn't help but feel a mixture of curiosity and caution towards the enigmatic sorcerer standing before her. Belle broke the lingering silence, interrupting the princess's inner thoughts. Your proposal is absurd. Do you even realize what you would be forfeiting if I won the wager? Belle questioned with a hint of skepticism. Our wager becomes official once you state what you desire from me, does it not? Princess responded calmly. Belle observed her demeanor. She appears not to be afraid of me at all. If she has heard anything of my reputation, she should behave with more caution. He thought. You are after my soul stone, the princess asserted. Are you truly willing to relinquish it? Pray, do you have any understanding of how it is made? Belle inquired. I do. Half of my life will be drained, forming a beautiful jewel. It cannot be taken by force and must be given willingly. There exists a tiny bit of magical power in every soul stone, but the most powerful stone is one which is created from the life force of an imperial. Sorcerers use these stones as a source of power, explained the princess. Yes, you are well aware of its purpose and at what cost it is made. However, I am sorry to inform you that I cannot kill the king of Duran so that you may become the empress. The founding emperor of this empire was no fool. Bell clarified, highlighting the limitations imposed by the spell on the imperial messenger. Your offer is quite tempting, but I cannot accept this wager, as it does not offer any possible gains, Bell asserted. But there is no provision that dictates when the news of the emperor's death must be delivered, is there? Princess suggested. While that is true, I prefer to rid myself of this hindrance as soon as I can. If there is longer than a month's delay in delivering the news, the succeeding emperor may hear it from another source, and that would be quite embarrassing for me. Bell explained. Fine. All that I ask, the princess tapped the table with force, is for you to delay fulfilling your duty for just one month. Why? Bell questioned. So that I may acquire a divorce in the meantime, the princess declared. Acquire a divorce? Bell echoed, surprised. Yes, that is what I wish to wager, whether or not I am able to obtain a divorce and claim the throne for myself, princess stated. In other words, you win the wager if you are divorced within the month, Bell summarized. Yes, and if I fail, I shall give you half of my lifespan. If I win, I shall become the new empress, and all that would be required of you is to fulfill your duty by declaring the news. Therefore, you stand to lose nothing even if you fail, the princess explained confidently. Then this wager has no merit. You dare to challenge the master of the enchanted tower, yet seek no compensation? Bell questioned. You need not look so offended. There is merit in this for me as well. In order for the wager to proceed, announcing the news of the emperor's death must be delayed. Not only that, but if you want my soul stone, you will have to prevent any harm from befalling me, no matter how brash my behavior may be, Princess reasoned. It appears you have ensnared me in a rather curious scheme. The wager was just a ploy to gain my support, was it not? Belle concluded, applauding the princess's strategic thinking. The princess merely smiled in response, her plan unfolding before her. The memory of a play orchestrated by the king to mock the princess lingers. Princess Arnia is vividly reminded of the painful spectacle. Nass! How dare you seduce his majesty! There is only one person who deserves to be by his side, and it's me, Arnia! The princess exclaims, snatching Nanissa's hair. Nanissa pleads. Your majesty! I shall bear the blame for it all, but please, have mercy on my unborn child! She staggers, uttering desperate pleas. King intervenes sternly. Nanisa! Speak no more! Princess Arnia tries to play along, proclaiming her devotion, but the king silences her with a sharp command. Hold your tongue, Arnia! The king dismisses the absurdity of the play. This is ridiculous. Prospects for Duran's artistic pursuits appear bleak, indeed. As the princess reflects on the humiliating performance, she recalls the audience's applause and the sinister motives behind it. 
This play was written to humiliate me, and I have no choice but to applaud. Is this their idea of amusement? The audience's reaction is mixed, with some clapping enthusiastically, while others murmur about Count Estia's relentless pursuit to make his daughter a queen. The princess wonders when the public will tire of this farce. Despite the disclaimer that the play is a work of fiction, she can't help but find the actor's name, Rick Tavian, suspiciously familiar. When will the public tire of this ludicrous play? Ahem. This performance was written as a work of fiction, unrelated to any real people or events. Could they have picked a more obvious name? Whispers circulate within the audience, discussing the male actor's rising reputation. That male actor has been making quite a name for himself. But of course, he's Rick Tavian, after all. There are rumors of Count Estia's illegitimate son, performing in cheap melodramas, fueling speculation about the actor's true identity. The king, reveling in the mockery, acknowledges the actor. I was quite impressed with your acting. Your eyes were very expressive. The performer stammers out his gratitude. Th thank you, your majesty. To further humiliate the princess, the king turns to her, smirking. What say you, my queen? Was there any line in the play that you found particularly memorable? Perhaps you'd like to recite one of the queen's lines for us. That would be quite amusing, indeed. Ha! Huh. As the royal court gathers for the commencement of the play, tension is palpable between Princess Arnoa and King Binus, with Larissa observing the unfolding spectacle. Princess Arnoa, seizing the opportunity, addresses the king. As you wish, your majesty. If you'll allow me, would it be all right if I received some assistance from the star of the play? The king, wearing a smirk, responds, Please do. I must say, it has been ages since you have shown such enthusiasm. Rick, you may step forth. Rick, the star of the play, nervously approaches. It is an honor to make your acquaintance, your majesty, he says with a nod. Princess Arnoa, with a mischievous glint in her eyes, instructs Rick to come closer. As he hesitates, she demands even more proximity, causing discomfort. It is true what they say. You truly are the most handsome man in all of Duran. You are just as I imagined you would be, she declares, leaving Rick shivering. Princess Arnoa continues her theatrical performance. You carry yourself with such a majestic air that those in your presence cannot help but lower their heads in admiration. None can wear that deep purple hue with more grace than you, your majesty. King Binus trembles with anger as the princess proceeds to place a ring on Rick's finger. This rich purple shade is the symbol of Duran's royalty. It is a color suited only for the bearer of this crown. Rick, now visibly distressed, stammers. Th this color symbolizes royalty. Only a person of royal lineage may wear purple. The audience begins to murmur. The princess, playing up the charade, slips the ring onto Rick's finger, stating, You are entirely correct, of course. That is why I wish to present you with this ring, whose elegant color suits you perfectly. Kindly accept it as a heartfelt gift from me, Arnoa. She quickly corrects herself with a smirk. Oops. Oh, it was Arnia, wasn't it? My apologies. I must now bring this act to a close. King Binas, seething with anger, questions the sanity of the queen. Has the queen lost her mind? Princess Anoa continues talking to Rick. You may keep that sapphire ring as a gift for putting on such a fabulous performance. Rick, startled, attempts to remove the ring and he says, Your Majesty, I will take off this ring right this instant. The audience reacts with shock. Larissa tries to intervene, claiming Rick had no intention of wearing the ring, but King Binas has heard enough. He snatches the ring from Rick, ordering, Get this scoundrel out of my sight! Rick pleads for forgiveness, but the king remains firm. Princess Arnoa, unfazed, glares back at the angry king. Glare all you want. You would not dare lay a finger on the imperial princess. As the guards escort Rick out while he screams for mercy, King Binus, frustrated, declares, I shall return to the palace at once. Larissa rushes after him, but the princess, contemplating the unfolding chaos, thinks, What has Larissa Estia gained from being Binus's first love? 
He mocks others all he likes but cannot stand being mocked in return. How can someone with such a self-centered attitude possibly rule over an entire empire? I managed to wound his pride, but that is hardly enough reason for a divorce. We shall see who prevails in the end. With a smirk, she moves away from the scene, leaving the palace in a state of turmoil. On the next beautiful morning, the sounds of chirping of birds have surrounded the palace, the royal trio, King Bainas, Princess Arnoa, and Larissa, sits at the breakfast table. The king reads a newspaper article praising the yesterday's play and performance of its main lead character named Rick and Princess, and the newspaper illustrate the exact dialogues of Princess about the main lead as the most handsome man in Duran, able to wear the color purple with grace and possessing the majestic air of a king. King Bainas, unimpressed, exclaims, This is absolute drivel! He flaps the newspaper dismissively. Princess Arnoa, with a mischievous gleam, pokes the king, asking, What is the matter, Binus? Were you not the one who wanted me to recite the lines from the play? The king, clearly irritated, retorts, As it appears you have entirely abandoned any sense of propriety, I must remind you that you are a queen, and I expect you to behave accordingly. Even if you were raised a naive princess who knows no better, Undeterred, Princess Arnoa continues cutting her steak, smirking. You need not remind me of my title. I couldn't possibly forget, as Larissa has been relentless in her quest to seize it from me. The king falls silent out of anger, and Larissa intervenes, trying to ease the tension. Your majesty, her majesty, the queen, seems a bit irritable today. Let us not concern ourselves with her and continue enjoying our meal. Here, would you like a taste? This is my favorite. Larissa lifts a piece of meat from her plate. King Binas, touched by her gesture, responds warmly. You are as kind as you are beautiful, Larissa. I shall let you have the first taste. Larissa takes a bite and expresses her enjoyment. It's delicious, your majesty. Princess Anoa, observing the exchange with a glance, decides to take her leave, saying, Ha! I shall take my leave now. As she departs, King Binas and Larissa share a moment, appreciating the delightful meal. The atmosphere lightens, and the king exclaims, I'm certain it's delicious. They continue to enjoy their breakfast, seemingly unaffected by the earlier tension. In the quiet recesses of Princess Arnoa's memories, a poignant conversation between her and her mother resurfaces. Princess Arnoa's mother imparts wisdom. Remember Noah. In order to win a servant's loyalty, you must only give one your undivided attention. A young and curious princess Arnoa inquires. Pardon me? Her mother, sensing the innocence in her daughter, asks. Are you all grown up? Princess Arnoa hesitates before responding. No. The mother continues her guidance. Then are you wealthy? Just like your father or uncle? Or even myself? Princess Arnoa understanding her modest circumstances, replies, No, I'm not wealthy either. The mother leans in, sharing a profound truth with her daughter. I shall tell you something very important, so I want you to listen closely. Wherever you go, seek just one person who has the greatest potential to be your aid. The young princess, absorbing this advice, seeks clarification. Just one person? Her mother nods, emphasizing the significance. Yes, choose the smartest of the bunch. The smartest, and give that person all of your trust and affection so that they would even risk their life for you if you so desired. Tenderly, she pats Princess Arnoa's head, leaving an indelible impression. When you lack power, that is the only way to gain an ally. In a quiet moment at the royal table, Princess Arnoa and Belle engage in conversation. Princess Arnoa reflects, Mother was absolutely right. Bell inquires, and your choice was Dr. Ludes? Princess elaborates on her decision. Correct. In a foreign kingdom with so many enemies, what one person could prove most useful to me? They would need to be able to detect any poison in my food, protect me from illness, and at times, even aid me in keeping my enemies in check. In other words, a physician. She wasn't the court physician but an apprentice. Dr. Lude stood out from the rest. 
She came from a family of scant means with many mouths to feed. And most importantly, she was a genius. Sorcerer Bell probes further. But is she truly poor? Royal physicians are paid handsomely, are they not? Princess clarifies. Not in the case of apprentices. In addition, her mother fell victim to an incurable disease, and Dr. Ludes was in desperate need of money for her treatment. The conversation shifts to a memory of Princess Arnoa discussing plans with Dr. Ludes. Princess expresses gratitude. You have been an indispensable help, Dr. Ludes. Dr. Ludes replies, It was no trouble at all, Your Majesty. I'd do anything to please you. Princess discusses the contraceptive medicine. The contraceptive medicine you concocted worked wonderfully on Larissa. You may stop administering it to her now. Dr. Ludes questions, Is it no longer a concern whether she becomes pregnant? Princess reveals her true intentions. Actually, I need her to show symptoms which indicate pregnancy. Dr. Ludes asks about the timeline. How soon do you require her to have such symptoms? Princess sets the deadline. I need her to be diagnosed in three weeks' time. Are you up to the challenge? She punctuates her request with a smile. Dr. Ludes confidently responds. Of course. I'll get started on mixing the ingredients right away. Sorcerer Bell acknowledges. Quite competent, indeed. Princess concludes the discussion about Dr. Ludes. As I told you, Dr. Ludes is a genius. I would not be alive to converse with you like this had it not been for her help. I'm sure Larissa is at a loss as to how I managed to survive all of her attempts to poison me. In a flashback, Larissa frustratedly questions her helper. Is this the best you can do? You told me she ingested the poison without a doubt. Why is she still alive? In the midst of their conversation, Belle drops an unexpected revelation. Belle asserts, No, not the physician. You. Princess, taken aback, exclaims, Me? C.A. Call. Belle, maintaining an air of mystery, states, I must step outside momentarily. With a swift movement, he springs up. Princess, puzzled, questions, What? But where are you going? Belle, already in motion, leaps away. Princess, left with bewilderment, mutters, He just comes and goes whenever he pleases, as if he were some kind of alley cat. In a mysterious jungle setting, Belle engages in an unusual conversation with an animal. Belle scolds, You were moving at a snail's pace. Did I not tell you to carry out your tasks promptly? Surprisingly, the animal transforms into a human, revealing Luca. Belle, unfazed, states, Luca? Luca, with theatrical flair, exclaims, You are too cruel. Do you really intend to nag me after all the time we've been apart? Are you not glad to see me? Belle, pragmatic as ever, replies, It has only been two days since I last saw you. Luca, dramatic, sighs, Well, it was the longest two days of my life. Ha! Cutting through the banter, Belle demands, Enough with all this chatter. What do you have to report? Luca, back on track, says, Oh, right. Ahem. There was a letter from Perhen. This time, a boy from the Lopen family is showing the signs. Bell acknowledges, Yes. I also heard that on the way here. What else? Luca, with a mischievous grin, adds, Oh, if you wish to hear some news regarding the Queen of Duran, during your absence, she drove an entire theatrical company to ruin. Bell, surprised, questions. What? Did she truly manage that in the span of just two days? Luca nods. Yes, she is quite a terror, contrary to her appearance. Bell, unfazed, inquires. Have you captured it in the artifact? Luca proudly presents the artifact. I have it right here. Although it is a bit blurry. I'm sure you're already aware, but Anakin always claims the entire stock every time new artifacts become available. Bell examines the artifact and comments. Wasn't she amazing? I witnessed the whole ordeal hidden just off the stage. The queen knew exactly the effect her words would have. It appeared to be all part of her plan. Luca agrees. Hmm, she certainly is competent. 
As Belle hands back the artifact, Luca adds, She desires to become the new empress, eh? She is better suited for the position than that fool, Luciano. Uh, Master Belcherius? Belle responds, Yes? Luca, alarmed, points at the palace. I'm afraid I just saw. A tense moment unfolds as Luca reveals. A band of assassins headed for the palace. Princess, unaware of the unfolding danger, greets Belle. Oh, Belle! Your back dash. Suddenly, chaos ensues. Dart! The scene is filled with the sounds of whooshing, thudding, and splashing. 